Would you please get a Bible and find the book of Jonah, chapter 4? Jonah, chapter 4. Thank you again, deacon brothers, for serving God's people. Uh, If you happen not to have a Bible, today there should be one under a, a seat next to you. And you can look up where the book of Jonah is there in the Old Testament, in the table of contents. If you hit the book of Micah, you went too far. It's to the left of Micah, one door down to the left. As you're turning there, I read of a true story in a, uh, one night in a church service where a young woman responded to God's call of salvation, and this precious young woman came to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. This particular young woman had a um, very rough past involving abuse of al- uh, alcohol and drugs and prostitution. But the change in her that Jesus does in our lives was evident in this precious young woman. And as time went on, she became a faithful member of this local church. It was not very long until this faithful young woman had caught the eye and caught the heart of the pastor's son. And the relationship grew and they began to make wedding plans. And that's when problems began in the church. About one half of the church did not think that a woman with such a past as hers, was suitable for the pastor's son. The church actually began to argue and fight about this matter, and they decided to have a Baptist business meeting. And all God's people said, oh, no. As the people made their arguments and tensions increased, the meeting became completely out of control. If you were in that meeting, what side would you you be on? Who would you support in that Baptist business meeting? Isn't it strange that as Christians who are forgiven by God's grace can have disdain, perhaps even hatred, for other people who are our enemies and still in their sins? Isn't that kind of strange? It happens. We can tend to be like, uh, we can tend uh, to be like, to love, rather, people like us, we tend to do that, right? Same language, same skin color, same values, you're good, I'm comfortable with you, all good. We tend to do that, naturally. Birds of a feather flock together. Is that in the Bible? No, it's not. But what about people who do not look like us, right? Or talk like us, or do not believe like us? Today I have two convicting questions from Jonah 4. All right, just two points. Two convicting questions from Jonah 4. And my prayer is that God would be glorified by increasing our compassion for the people, listen, for the people we disdain because of their wickedness. This is a very convicting message. Okay? So that's my prayer. That's my hope. I'm laying all my cards on the table before we begin. Okay? My prayer is that God would be glorified by increasing our compassion for the people we disdain because of their wickedness. All right? Now, for some big Bible context, and then we get to the passage. Scholars have dated from uh, the book of Jonah uh, anywhere from uh, 70, uh, rather 750 B.C. to about 250 B.C. That's kind of a long stretch there. We're not quite sure, but that's the window that scholars date the book. 750 B.C. to 250 B.C. The Old Testament background to the book of Jonah is the Tower of Babel, okay? This is where God divides humanity by language and also by the number of the sons of God. God allotted the nations to these supernatural beings according to a few passages in the Bible that perhaps you're not familiar with, so let me give them to you. You might want to write them down as I read them. For example, Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. It says, when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, which was where? At the Tower of Babel. He fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God, but the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. Keyword, allotted. It's also found in Deuteronomy 4.19. And beware not to lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, and be drawn away and worship them and serve them, those which the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. 
Did you catch that? Never caught this growing up. Listen to me, Oklahoma Baptist University, right? Master of Divinity, Doctorate of Ministry. Did not get this growing up in church. This is massively important. This is how the Bible story goes. Strike one with humanity, Genesis 3, alienation from God, death enters the world. Strike two with humanity, Genesis 6, sons of gods come down, right? Bear the, uh, the Nephilim, the giants. They also, according to Jewish commentary on the Genesis 6 narrative, that they taught humanity how to sin better. Sin proliferates through occult knowledge, uh, through the um, sexual immorality, through drugs, and what's the fourth one? What's the other one? What's that? Warfare, good, excellent, warfare, that's right. The arts of weaponry, those are the four things. And this is the background, all the ancient people know this when they're reading Genesis 6, 1 through 4, but we don't, that's why there's a large gap. This is why there's such violence in the land. When you read further past verse 4 in Genesis 6, there are two things mentioned as to why there's a flood. Number one, corruption. Everything's corrupted. Humanity, animals, everything is corrupted. It's used three times. And then the other word is violence. And Pastor John, whom I thank publicly for preaching last Sunday, he, he uh, probably highlighted in Je uh, Jonah 3 that what filled the city of Nineveh? Violence. Specifically, violence, okay? So a good God says, I'm sorry I made all of you, but it would have been a real short Bible if we just stopped there, but Noah found favor in the eyes of God, right? And then the flood, the waters recede. Let's try this again. God gives Noah and his three sons the same Edenic mandate that he gave Adam and Eve, right? Go, fill the earth, right? Multiply, have dominion. How'd that work out? Just a few chapters later, you got this guy named, what's his name? Uh, Nimrod, don't be a Nimrod, amen, right? What does his name mean? Nimrod means we shall rebel, right? He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, you remember that? And we might like read that on the surface and say, cool, I like Nimrod, he likes hunting. No, no, he's a mighty hunter of men. He, listen to me very carefully. He was the first totalitarian ruler on the planet. And all of those in Russia said, oh no, right? Totalitarianism, Nimrod. And so he builds this, uh, he has a kingdom, four cities. What's the first city named? Babel. That's the Tower of Babel. They build this tower. And back then, they had an ancient uh, <clears throat> uh, temples that were tied to these, they're called ziggurats, right? And basically, it's a big corporate collective citywide. We hate you. We don't want you. We're disobeying you and the mandate you've given us as humanity. Strike three, humanity. You're out. You're out. I'm done with you. This is the pinnacle as to how the story goes. And it's out of that context where God divides humanity by language and also by the number of the sons of God. God basically says, oh, you don't want me up here? Let's try, I'll give you somebody else. Let's see how that works, uh, uh, works out. And how does that work out? Idolatry, idolatry. Guess, um, uh, guess what Nineveh means? Fish house, fish house. And when you study the ancient background of Nineveh, guess what they worshiped? They worshiped a God in the form of a fish, half fish, half man. You see what God's doing? He's doing what he always does. He's going after the idols. He's going after the gods, right? How do I know that? What's the first of the big 10? We call them the, the big 10 commandments. What's number one? You will have no other gods before me. He's always going after the gods. So idolatry is the number one problem of humanity not just tucked into a book that has four chapters in Jonah, but for the rest of the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, idolatry. Jesus put it this way. Remember, he summarized it. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Remember that? And love your neighbor as yourself. This is where idols come in. This is where supernatural beings come in, and they try to alter our love and affection for someone else or something else. And they're, in America... They're usually good things and good people. 
like your family, like your children. That's why Jesus says, if you don't hate your brother, your mother, your father, you cannot be my disciple. Jesus must come first. So Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. Deuteronomy 4.19, the key word allotted. There's another one, Deuteronomy 29.26, quote, they went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods whom they have not known, key phrase, and whom he had not allotted to them. Allotted, 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 key phrase. So that's what God does with the nations. And it's out of that context that God calls Abram. So it was like, a, I'm done with, you, uh, done with you, humanity, but yet God is a gracious God. And what did he say to Abram? Uh, Paul calls it the gospel in Galatians 3.8. He said, Abram, uh, out of your seed, I'm going to bless the nations. And in the book of Galatians, whom is that seed? His name is Jesus. And before he goes back to the right hand of the Father in power and glory, he tells this little band of uh, disciples, go make disciples of the nations. Go take the nations back. Praise the Lord. So even before the Great Commission, what I'm seeing in the book of Jonah is God still has compassion for the pagan nations even within the Old Testament. Amen. Israel was supposed to be a conduit for the other nations to come to Yahweh, and they failed miserably. How did they fail? Number one problem, idolatry. It began at the Tower of Babel, Babel, right? Then the kingdom stage, and then what happened at exile? Where did they end in exile? Babel. Babel to Babel. It bookends. It bookends. So Jonah is angry over God's compassion for the people he fears and the people he hates, and he's a prophet of God. And all God's people said, oh me, it's very convicting. Now, the look on some of your faces, you look all pure and holy, and you have no disdain or disregard for anyone or anybody. But, man, this is a convicting message. Big time. God's man is not happy that God did not overthrow the city. Now, if you weren't with Pastor John last week, right, what was the message that Jonah spoke to the uh, Ninevites? You remember? Basically, it was this. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Is that what he said? Did he lead off like that? I'm asking you. No, he did not. What was it? Basically this. You've got 40 days, and then God's going to overthrow this place. God's going to burn it down. You've got 40 days. What's that? That's a message of judgment. And beloved, America needs to hear that. Amen. Amen. Well, why? That's awful mean. That's awful dark. That's awful gloomy. That's not very loving. Mm. You don't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is a precious, compassionate, gracious thing to warn someone of what's about to come. Right? Very compassionate. You've got 40 days. You know, <clears throat> I wonder how many days America has. I wonder how many days we have in America. I wonder how many days this world has left before Jesus Christ is going to come in power and glory. And every eye shall see him. And he's not going to be riding in meek and mild little donkey Jesus riding. No, no. He's riding a white stallion, and the angelic armies are going to be behind him. And it's judgment time. It's judgment time. This is why the world goes mad and says really stupid things like, there is no God. The fool has said that in his heart. There is no God. No one plus nothing equals everything? Really? That's what evolution says. No, no. God created the heavens and the earth, right? Right? God created the heavens on the earth. I mean, open your eyes. Don't you see his glory? Look at ants. Look at your eye. Your organs. Is all this just like a happenstance? No, 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 no. You got 40 days. Chapter 3, everybody repents. Everybody. From the, pa the pagan king calls upon uh, the city to repent, and everybody's fasting. And it, 
And there's debate about whether the repentance is genuine. I think it's genuine. And God does not judge the city. Now let's look at how Jonah responds, chapter 4. And go ahead and stand, if you would, at the reading of God's word. All right? Have I lost anybody? You okay? Hear the word of the Lord. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. What was he displeased about, right? He didn't sin. God did not judge the city. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. The Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in uh, the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. He still wants to see the fire fall. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Verse 6, so the Lord God appointed a plan and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun uh, beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die saying, death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry even to death. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right hand and left hand, as well as many animals? This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, as we Move into the preaching of your word. I pray that you would anoint to preach and anoint to listen. I pray as a result you would press your people and myself further into the image of Jesus Christ, that you would strengthen her, you would minister to your people supernaturally, Father, as the word goes out, including those that are online, Lord. Do your great work, and we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, two convicting questions. Two convicting questions. Number one, do you have unresolved anger in your heart? Do you have unresolved anger in your heart? Jonah disagrees with God for having mercy on the wicked Assyrians. He is disgusted and he is in despair. <laughs> this is so shocking because... Revival happened the entire city. I mean, could you imagine through the preaching of uh, this local church, right, that the entire city of the colony repents? Wouldn't that be wonderful? I'm sorry, is my mic on? Do I need to repeat the question? Wouldn't that be just absolutely fantastic? Well, we've got the, we've got the mayor, the mayor calling for Fasting, not a preacher, man. The mayor is saying, we need to fast, everybody, because God's going to bring judgment on the colony. What's that online thing, the, the, the chatter colony? What's that? The colony chatter? Yeah, but it's social media stuff. It's, it's, it's crazy. Can you, and then the colony chatter, that social uh, media, whatever, online, is now chattering about the goodness of God. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Instead of complaining about well, I saw uh, First Baptist Church, they, they put up all those blue and pink crosses on their lawn, and I can barely drive past it, right? These kind of things. Instead of hearts becoming hardened by the graciousness of God, hearts are opened. It's like, wow, I can be forgiving of all my sin. Like abortion, I can be free from that. I can be forgiven of the weight of that, the burden of that in Jesus Christ. But nope, not Jonah. 
He's ticked off because of a citywide revival. There is a dark spiral downward uh, dynamic that happens when we harbor deep-seated anger. Ephesians 4, somewhere around verse 32. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Next verse. And don't give the devil a topos. The Greek word is topos. It's used 83 times in the New Testament. 81 out of the 83 times, it always refers to a place of occupation. It's where we get the word topography. Don't let the, uh, your anger go down. Uh, don't let the sun go down on your anger, meaning unresolved anger leads to what? Bitterness. And bitterness is like opening up the door and saying, hey, devil and demons, come on in to our lives. And he's talking to Christians. He's talking to Christians. Unresolved anger. Anger comes from different things like unmet expectations. Despite obeying the Lord, Jonah has quite has actually not quite given up his hatred. He wants to see God's judgment on the Assyrians. Now, I'm calling this the sorriest prayer in the Bible, what we, what we just see in this uh, chapter. This is the sorriest prayer. Chapter 4 includes the sorriest prayer in the Bible. If you can show me one that's worse, I'd like to know it. Just go ahead and email me or, or text it to 33222, Okay. This is actually really embarrassing. How did the book of Jonah, it's just a little one, it's okay. How, how did the book of Jonah make it into the Old Testament canon? If I'm on the Bible steering committee, I'm not voting for Jonah to make it into the Old Testament. Prophets are not supposed to talk like this. They're not supposed to have this hatred. And yet, when we search our hearts, oh, this is very convicting, if we're honest. It's very convicting. So let's take another look at this sorriest prayer in the Bible. Pick up again verse 2. Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, he knew revival was coming, and he didn't want it to happen. Let's, let's show up the map. Let's show the map for him on the, uh, on the screen. In order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. Where's Tarshish? Tarshish. Everybody say Tarshish. Right? It's on the other side of the known world. Right? Goes down to Joppa. I'm out of here. It's like boarding a plane on Fort Worth headed to Taiwan. I'm out of here. He didn't say anything. He just left. I knew you're a gracious and compassionate God. Boo-hoo, right? Slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. Sorry is prayer in the Bible. Come on. Come on, Jonah, really? Elijah prayed that the Lord would take his life too, but that was because he thought he was the only righteous man left, Right? Both are selfish prayers, but Jonah's problem is far greater. So, even though this is the sorriest prayer in the Bible, let's see if we can gain some things through this sorriest prayer in the Bible. I see at least six. All right, let's go through these real quick concerning God. Real quick, God is gracious. God is gracious. Who are we to have hatred in our heart for those that are doing wicked things when we too were once outside of Jesus Christ and just as wicked, right? In the sight of a holy God. God is gracious. You may recall in the parable of the landowner that Jesus speaks about where the landowner gave some uh, wage to the workers who worked different number of hours. Do y'all remember that? Like early in the day, the landowner comes and says, hey, would you come work on our land? And they agree on a Daenerys, right, on the wage. And then a couple uh, hours later, he goes and hires some more. And then late in the evening, he hires uh, one other person. Well, when, it's, when the landowner comes time to pay, everybody gets the same wage. And the people that worked under the hot sun for more hours than the last guy, they're ticked off, right? And Jesus says, the landowner says this in Matthew 20, 15, uh, beginning in 13, quote, but he answered and said to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? 
take what is yours and go, but I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Now get this. Or is your eye envious because I am generous? Yeah, God had a generous eye toward the wicked Assyrians in the Ninevites. And then Jesus concludes, so the last shall be first and the first last. That's what God does to our human values, doesn't he? He turns them upside down and he shakes them omnipotent hard. The last shall be first in God's kingdom. God is gracious. Secondly, God is compassionate. We have to keep this in the context of Jonah. We should add that God is compassionate to those we hate, even for their wickedness. God's grace and compassion, they're scandalous, scandalous. They're shocking, like that young woman I told you about at the beginning of the, uh, the message, right? She came out of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and prostitution, and that scandalous grace is causing a problem in the local church. Jesus blew up the religious landscape all over Palestine. He was an agitator to the religious folks, especially the elite, the leaders, the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus was the consummate iconoclast. He would rebuke the religious leaders and he would include ad hominem attacks. He called them sons of hell. He called them white sepulchers. He called them vipers and two-faced hypocrites. Do you know why he did that? Because they were worthy of it. Very carefully. When Jesus used the most harshest words, it's always with the hardest of hearts. That's why. The harder the heart, the harsher the words from King Jesus. Jesus Christ would touch lepers. The modern equivalent in America would be to help those with AIDS, right? Jesus Christ would talk with prostitutes. The modern equivalent would be to talk with prostitutes. Amen, right? He would hang out with the one percenters. The religious people called Jesus, quote, a gluttonous man and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. You know why they called him that? Because at times he would hang out with those kind of people, right? Those that were hated by the religious elite who didn't participate in those, those kind of sins. Jesus Christ would sip wine with them, spend time with them. Didn't Jesus say something about praying for our enemies? He does. Matthew 5, 47, Jesus Christ says, I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Beloved, you don't hear that a lot in evangelistic altar calls. If there is not a radical change in our hearts to the point of loving our enemies and praying for those that persecute us, then we really need to consider if we have been truly born again. Search your hearts this morning, beloved. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, Verse 45 of Matthew 5, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. And then Jesus continues, for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you only greet your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? So, let those that wear the military uniform follow their commanders and fight just wars and kill people. We will support them, every one of them, and let's follow our commander as God's people, the church, King Jesus. Amen? Amen? Consider our hearts. There's a third thing I see in this sorry prayer. God is slow to anger. He is slow to anger. He's not a capricious God. He's not impulsive. He's not fickle or erratic. He's slow to anger. So unlike me. So unlike us. We're quick to anger. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. The anger of God does not reflect the anger of man. God is in a class all by himself. Amen. He's God. 
And so his love is a distinctly holy love. His anger is a different anger than ours. Here's another thing I see in the prayer. God is full of chesed, H-E-S-E-D, uh, translated as mercy or loving kindness in uh, verse 2 there. He's full of covenant love, loyal love, at chesed, mercy. You know, it's difficult sometimes, and there's mystery here, as it relates to the anger of God and the love of God. Because was God angry over the evil of the Ninevites? Yes or no? Okay, we could pick up what, Psalm 5.5, 5, God is angry with the wicked every day, right? But yet here we have God sending this rebellious prophet, albeit reluctantly and defiantly, in order to give them the message of warning of judgment, and they repent. Is God surprised that they repent? No, he's God. Part of what it means to be deity is he knows the future, and not only that, he's working out all things together for the good of his people, right? And so there's, there's, there's this compassion, the love of God as well. One Bible commentator writes about the anger of God and the love of God. I'll quote him. So an important distinction must be made. God loves believers with a particular love. It is a family love, the ultimate love of an eternal father for his children. It's the consummate love of a bridegroom for his bride. It is an eternal love that guarantees their salvation from sin and its ghastly penalty. That special love is re reserved for believers alone. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, he died for his bride. For anyone and everyone who would repent and place their faith in Jesus Christ. Matthew, what is it, 121. The angel says why Jesus Christ came, right? To save his people from their sins. That's what God does. Amen. It's an effectual call when God calls you. And just like Jonah, amen. You want to talk about grace. Just like Jonah, God's grace and mercy overcame our rebellious will and we surrendered. By grace we're saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. Amen. Amen. What a great God this is. A, a God that's slow to anger, anger, full of covenant love. God says through the uh, prophet Ezekiel, chapter 33, verse 11, as I live, declares the Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his evil way and live, turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? You see the pleading, compassionate heart of God through the prophet Ezekiel? Here's another thing from this sorry prayer. God is willing to relent from impending judgment. He's willing to relent from impending judgment. Does this mean God changed his will? Pastor Mark, I say no. It means he wills a change. Amen. There are two tracks to the will of God in the Bible. His revealed will, right? His revealed will and his secret will. Here we could pull in uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed to us and to our sons forever, uh, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of this law. Beloved, never forget how great your God is in covenant love, in being slow to anger, in willing to relent from impending judgment. Listen, I know it's crazy out there, and it's so easy to get caught up with all of the craziness that we're seeing from this current administration, right? And I heard some uh, preachers, a particular one that I respect very much, basically says, it's over for America, okay? I'm not willing to go there yet. You know why? Because I don't know what God's going to do, right? Who knows? He may send the third great awakening, amen. We have no idea what God is. So don't hang it up, beloved. Keep focused on the mission. Keep focusing and growing in your understanding of who am I? What does it mean for me to say I am a Christian? I am a Christ follower. 
Grow in your understanding of your identity in Jesus Christ. Persevere in doing good in seeking to help us fulfill the mission of this church. Praise God for Rachel Hethington and all of um, those of you that helped to do this uh, awareness human trafficking walk. Amen? Praise God. What a great thing we were doing as a church in the community. What's coming up in the life of this church? How can we uh, bring people to Jesus Christ in the month in which the world celebrates death? What's happening this Wednesday? Family Fall Carnival. Hey, you want to come to church and get some candy? We got some blow-ups, we got some games? Yeah, well guess what? Before they get to the, the candy and the games that are gonna be up in here, they're gonna hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Yeah, you're gonna hear the gospel before you come up and get the, the free stuff, amen. Who knows, what God, who knows? Could it be that the third great awakening could start with the family fall carnival? You have no idea. I think it was the second great awakening that started with a bunch of teenagers, about 10 of them, in a rainstorm near a haystack. And one of those teenagers cried out in tears, broken over sin. Boom. We have no idea what God's doing. We have no idea. That's why we got to stay faithful, stay fake, uh, focused on the mission. Because there's a destiny that's coming. There's a destiny. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, beloved. Never forget who God is. We're not here ultimately to condemn. That does not mean we do not call sin, sin, and call out sinners, okay? It means we reach out to others with the gospel that saves. In fact, 200 years later, God's going to destroy Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire, okay? 200 years later, he does blow it up. I see another thing here very quickly. God is willing to go to extremes to teach us. Verse 6. <clears throat> Look at the extremes in verse 6. So the Lord appointed a plant. It grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. Right? Jonah was really happy about the plant. God appointed a worm. When dawn came the next day, it attacked the plant, withered it. The sun came up. Uh, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head, so he became faint and begged with all of his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. Wow, do you see how far God is going to teach the prophet about his compassion? Biology is teaching theology, right? God appoints four things in the narrative, the greater narrative, a great fish, a plant, a worm, and a scorching east wind. Unfortunately, Jonah was very shallow. The kindness of the Lord gave relief to Jonah, even in his shallowness, to relieve his discomfort. And Jonah is extremely happy about the plant. So what does God do? He sends one of his worms in, amen. One of God's worms come in and attacks the plant, but he doesn't stop there. This a scorching east wind is probably a reference to something similar to what's called a Sirocco. Have you ever heard of that term before, a Sirocco? <clears throat> it happens in the Middle East. Think of it like a hurricane on fire. I grew up in Florida, so I know hurricanes. Think of it, a Sirocco is like a hurricane on fire. Imagine a hurricane with the temperature being over 100 degrees. It can be extremely oppressive and can last a half a day or up to several days. Can you imagine that? In some countries, if a crime is committed during a Sirocco wind, it can bring a lesser charge or a lesser sentence, okay? So this tells me what God wants us to know. We are here not simply to be comfortable, and we live in the most comfortable nation on earth, do we not? Amen. Did you have a shower this morning? You like warm, lukewarm? Do you like it hot? Do you like it cold? Did you use the restroom this morning? Did you have to go outside to use the restroom this morning? Do you have any food in your pantry? It's so comfortable here in America. God goes to extremes to teach his prophet. God went in order to teach us about his compassion. 
When I think about the word appoint, he appointed, he appointed, he appointed. Ultimately, God did not appoint a fish for us. He did not appoint a plant or a worm for us or an east wind Sirocco. He appointed his son, Jesus Christ, through whom he made the world to come and die for our sins on the wood of shame. That's what he appointed. He appointed his son for us, church. Amen. Why did he do that? Listen very carefully. Listen very carefully in the context of Jonah. Why? Because he had compassion for wicked sinners like you and me. He had compassion. If you have never repented of your sins, you must turn from your life of rebellion against God and trust him to save you. Hell is real. And the scariest thing about hell is God is there for one purpose and one purpose only. It's to punish. It's an almighty God. People of God, what comfort is God eating away at your life? The worms eating away the comfort that the plant brought. What is God eating away at your life? God may be destroying the comfort he has given you in order to teach you something. What lesson are you learning or is it turning into a loathing of God? What Sirocco wind is God blowing into your life causing discomfort to you? It's for a plan. It's for a purpose. Do you know what God wants you to learn from it? I'll tell you, it's the second word, number two, and then we'll be done. Do you share God's kind mercy for others totally unworthy of it? Do you share God's kind mercy for others totally uh, unworthy of it? What a piercing question in verse nine. Would you look at the piercing question with me in verse nine? God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? What should the answer have been? Are you with me? Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? What Jonah should have said was, no, no. But instead, what is he saying? I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Look at the Lord's logic here. You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. In the providence of God, God was allowing the Ninevites to live. He let them get married. He let them work. He fed them. Verse 11, should I not have compassion on Nineveh? the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and their left hand, as well as many animals. Boy, don't you get that sense as to what's happening in society when you read the news, right? These people don't know their left from their right. They can't find out whether they're a male or a female. They're out of their minds. That's what sin does to the mind. God's question is piercing. Jonah's answer is pathetic. Never forget what really matters, beloved. We need to have God's uh, perspective. The stuff of this life matters little compared to the eternal matters. That's why politicians can hijack a pandemic because everybody in the world is afraid to die and they will give up their freedoms that are embedded in our Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Wake up, church. Totalitarianism is creeping into, uh, I want to say it's no longer creeping, it's here. It's here. And what are we going to do about it as God's people? Stick with the mission. We need to have God's pity. The souls of the lost matter tremendously. There was an attack in Sri Lanka where 75 people gathered for worship. 
the attackers burst through the open doors and an angry mob of about 1,000 people were outside of this, this church. Thank God we don't have to worry about that, that kind of a thing here, right? In one area, pastor, pastors had to walk the perimeter of their church building, get this, to check for landmines every Sunday morning. Anybody want to be part of the landmine committee in this church? Next. Next man up. So convicting, isn't it? Convenience is going to kill us. We need to be on the alert. Convenience will kill the mission of this church. It will cut us off from our head, and when a church gets cut off from its head, Jesus Christ, he removes the lampstand and lets, lets it to itself. And it's always a slow death. No, stay focused on the mission. In one part of the world, there is great persecution of the church, but despite this persecution, the attacks have not hampered spreading the gospel. In fact, one leader says, quote, God has been preparing us for this uh, persecution all along. He knew. And this pastor went on to testify of how important and strategic it is for a, a church to have small groups that meet in their homes to spread the gospel and to grow the church. That's why we have small groups in this church. Amen. Amen. Community groups, Sunday morning, small groups throughout the week. Are you a part of one? Are you a part of one? When we truly have God's compassion in our hearts, it won't be enough to attend a Bible study. <laughs> in order to avoid the Jonah syndrome, every Bible study group must have some sort of outreach. Every Bible group has some sort of outreach. So, beloved, how's your community groups doing with that? All right? Are we going to take advantage of the Fall Carnival this Wednesday. Again, let's look at verse 11. Hear the word of the Lord. This is so good. It's so convicting. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons? You know, a lot of church people, you know what they count? Well, it's in your bulletin. Church people count how many come. But I wonder if that's how God counts. I wonder if God counts how many are not here. Right? Anybody concerned about that? Maybe we should add that, Donna. Uh, maybe we should add that to the bulletin. How many people don't go to church in the city of the colony? You know what that number is? It's close to 38,000. Is that right, Pastor? Pastor Wally, about that? I remember one time I added up the seating capacity of every church in the city of the colony. Oh, it's just a fraction of the population of our town. God, send revival. God, send awakening. And let it start in my heart. Amen. Let it start in this church. Amen. Let it start in this church. Amen. Amen. There was great evil in Nineveh. And evil leads people to do stupid, irrational things. They don't know their left hand from their right. You remember how I started this message? With a young woman who had a sinful past but became a believer in Jesus. And soon the pastor's son and her uh, courted one another and they had wedding plans and they had that church, Baptist business meeting over it, right? As the people made their arguments and tensions increased, it got out of hand. The young woman became very upset about all the things being brought up about her past. Can you imagine that? Church people getting up and talking about her prostitution past or her drug abuse past and why she shouldn't, she, this isn't the right girl for the pastor's son to marry. Can you imagine that? As she began to cry, the pastor's son stood up to speak. He could not bear the pain it was causing his wife to be he began to speak, quote, my fiance's past is not what is on trial here. What you are questioning is the ability of the blood of Jesus to wash away sin. Today, you have put the blood of Jesus on trial. 
So does it wash it away or not? The Spirit of God took those words. Great conviction fell upon the entire church. And there was confession of sin. And there was a sweet unity that came into that body through that. And yet, that was within the church. One of the lessons from the book of Jonah is we need to have that compassion for those outside of the church because we came up out of the same kingdom of darkness that right, the others are. Those that we fear and those that we hate, whether it's because of skin color or economic status or car or what, all this, put all that aside. It's not an accident that the book ends with this stinging question from the Lord. In fact, it's open-ended, isn't it, how it, how it ends? How, how did Jonah respond? Would you like to know how Jonah responded? I can't give it to you. We don't know. And that's for a reason, that God, God, God does not want us to know how Jonah responds. He left the question open for us today. 